We're very pleased to have with us today a true aviation enthusiast, literally from his first words as a child. He has been immersed and involved with aviation. He has flown them, he's flown in them, and he's met the people who made history in them. He has contributed numerous articles to a long list of periodicals and magazines, and he is the author of many historical non-fiction books, such as Bridge Busters, Fable 15, which is about the Hellcat, and the comprehensive story of the F-6F Hellcat. I greatly um, am pleased to introduce to you a true airplane nut, Mr. Tom Cleaver. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, today is the 72nd anniversary of the Hellcat Trade of Day, the Mariana Turkey shoot, June 19th, 1944. But uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about the history of the airplane and clear up some of the mythology that's, um, that's been around about the airplane forever. Um, the Hellcat was not designed to defeat the hero. If, it had been, if that had been the case, it would never, it would, it would never have been happened because they wouldn't have been able to do it in time. Uh, in 1940, the Navy got, the Navy had two mono, monoplanes finally uh, for fighters. Uh, the main one was the F-4F Wildcat. This is a uh, an airplane that, had been, that began life as a biplane, became a monoplane. Um, it was not designed really to, uh, to fly against other fighters. It was designed to, de to defeat uh, torpedo bombers and dive bombers that would be attacking the fleet. It was a fleet defense fighter. Um, now, the unfortunate thing was that the U.S. Navy made the mistake of thinking that the Japanese Navy, Navy torpedo bombers and dive bombers were like the Navy's torpedo bombers and dive bombers. Uh, the, the Kate, the Japanese torpedo bomber, was about twice the, twice the uh, performance of, of the Devastator, and that's why the uh, Kate ended up sinking two carriers in the first two, in the first two uh, battles because uh, they couldn't keep up with it. But anyway, in 1940, the U.S. Navy knew that they needed to have a follow-on, a much better follow-on than, than the Wildcat, and so they ended up protecting and uh, Chance Bot came up with the VF4U Corsair. This is the prototype. Um, the Corsair was the first American fighter that could was the first American fighter uh, that could fly over 400 miles an hour. It was quite a handful of an airplane. The reason the wings are bent is because they wanted to keep the landing gear short because it had a 16-foot propeller out in front of it. Um, the unfortunate thing was that the uh, that a single prototype crashed about six months after they, they started flying it and uh, had to be completely rebuilt. By that time, they had discovered that there was going to be a lot of changes. Um, you can see that nose has gotten a whole lot longer. Um, the, the prototype had fuel in the wings. They decided they had to put guns in the wings, so they had to put the fuel someplace, and they had to put it around the, the center line of the, the center of gravity, so it ended up in front of the cockpit. The uh, end result was an airplane that was known by its pilots as Old Hose Nose, and uh, by younger pilots as the Ensign Eliminator. And uh, it was a difficult airplane to fly. It was. Uh, it was not very compatible with an aircraft carrier as it first, you know, as it first happened. The, uh, the uh, landing gear was much too stiff and it bounced and it went all over the deck and, uh, event and eventually the first three squadrons that had them turned them in because they couldn't get them on the carrier. Uh, the fourth squadron again, BF-17, figured out how to debounce it. They figured out to put a, a stall warning strip on the right wing so that it wouldn't Fall over, the, fall over on its side on the pilot, on final approach, as, as it could do. Um, but the end result of that was that the Navy spent about an extra two years getting this airplane made. It looks something like this, and it still has 
the trouble you could, uh, of getting aboard a carrier. You couldn't see the carrier route out in front, out in front of the airplane when you were final approach. But uh, what the Navy tried to do was they, suggest, they thought to themselves, why not make a, bit, a better wildcat for an interim fighter? We'll put an R-2600 on it. They could have put, a, put an R-1830 on it and, then the, and made the FM-2, which, which they eventually did and was a pretty good airplane. It was the, it was the wilder wildcat, as they called it. But uh, they, went to, they went to Grumman and they said, can you put a bigger engine on the, uh, on the wildcat? And Grumman said, well, you know, that's like making a whole new airplane. So why don't we make a whole new airplane with a good airplane? And that was this, the F6F Hellcat. This is the, this is the first one. Um, Bob Hall, who, start, who got his work starting, uh, starting working for the Granville brothers designing GB Razors in the 30s, had been over in, had been in, uh, in England during the Battle of Britain, and he talked to the pilots and he found out what they needed, and he said, we're going to make an airplane with a whole lot of gasoline, with a great big wing that can carry a whole lot of ammunition, and many guns as possible, and it can stay up forever and shoot down anything. And that's what they suggested. And, and uh, Leroy Grumman said, okay, sounds good to us. They went and they talked to the guys at the, uh, at the, at the fighter wing in, in, at the of, of, uh, Naval, of, of Aeronautics, and they said, okay, put an R-2600 on it. Bob Hall said, you know, it really needs an R-2800. And they said, well, this is what we can do. So they ended up making the, the F6F1, which had an R2600 on it. Um, if they had gone, that, gone this route with the airplane, the end result would have been an airplane that was not too much better than the Wildcat. It would have been about 20 miles an hour faster, and it wouldn't have had the maneuverability. But, they managed, but, but, but while they were designing the airplane, guys like Butch O'Hare came back from combat in the Pacific and said, you need a bigger engine. You need a higher cockpit so that it can, so I can see out see out to land. Yeah, that, you can see that in the, they had the best uh, the, the best visibility on, on on landing of any of any Navy airplane. So they managed to convince the Navy to make a second prototype with an R20 with an, the R2800 in it, 2,000 horsepower, the finest aeronautical engine aero piston engine ever made. Um, and that did everything. The speed went up 60 miles an hour over the Wildcat. Flying rate, everything. And um, unfortunately, about three months after they uh, started flying it, they ended up landing in a, in a potato patch. But by that time, they knew they had a winner. There, there, there were fewer, there were fewer. Uh, modifications to this airplane between prototype and the last airplane than any other fighter was ever made. The only thing that changed was the, was the engine, the head of the firewall, and the, the uh, cockpit, the, the, uh, the cockpit on it. Um, essentially, the F6F3 and the F6F5 are differentiated by an engine. With the uh, F6F5 having, with the F6F5 having an a, uh, engine with a more higher, high altitude rating. The, uh, <coughs> the Wildcat, the Hellcat first flew a month before they found the Apicon Zero, the Zero that was in, that was in the Aleutian. When they got the, the Apicon Zero and started flying it, they discovered that the, that the Hellcat was going to have no trouble as long as it stayed over 250 miles an hour. The Zero is a really nice airplane. It's got a really big air aileron and if you're at, under about 230 miles an hour, you can outmaneuver just about anything. But as you go up in speed, that it, those ailerons get stiff and stiff and stiff. And over 250 miles an hour, those ailerons are set in concrete. So a guy has, his, his hydraulic system is a right, is a, is a right arm on a, on a stick. And so they discovered that they stayed high, if they stayed fast, and if they particularly stayed in the vertical plane, the Hellcat was going to have no trouble with the Zero. This is the, among the first ones. Here they are. Uh, between the uh, between September 1944, uh, of 1942, when they when they built 13 of them, 
and September 1945 when they finished the uh, 13,320th. Um, Drummond built all of those at their, at their Bethpage plant. They were building 500 a month uh, from, from about July of 44 to the end of the war. Um, these are going aboard the Yorktown in the, fall, in, the, uh, in, the, in the summer of 43. These are Hellcats of VF-6, which was the squadron that uh, Butch O'Hare was, was in command of after he won the Medal of Honor. And they're on the uh, Enterprise here. This is Jimmy Flatley, who was the uh, fighter leader at, at Coral Sea, and this is aboard the Lexington, the Blue Ghost. You might notice on the leading edge of the wing, here you see the, the machine guns are untowled. Here they have some uh, fairings of them. That was the one big change here from the individual to take those fairings off to cool the gun for November 5th, 1943, the first time that carrier-based aircraft attacked a major, la a major land base that was defended by people who knew they were coming, unlike Pearl Harbor. This is an attack against the Japanese base of LaFall. Um, the, the invasion of Bougainville had happened. The Japanese were coming down. They fought the battle with their best friends there. And, um, they, and they were desperately worried that the, that the Japanese were going to send more ships down from truck to the ball and, and come in and attack the invasion because they didn't have, it was commonly called Operation Shoestring. They didn't have the ships to, to face up to it. So the uh, Navy sent in the uh, Saratoga and the Princeton on November 5th. These are guys from BF-12 on the Saratoga manning their Hellcats. And they attacked and they attacked the ball and they sank three cruisers in the harbor. Uh, they came back on November 11th with the Saratoga and the Princeton and the Bunker Hill, the Essex, and the, uh, in the, and the Independence. Uh, and uh, pretty much destroyed Japanese air power in the, in, in the South Pacific. This was the one time that the Hellcat was really up against the A-list of the Japanese pilots. Um, the guys who were in the 90th percentile, because there weren't very many of them left. Uh, in, the, in the fall of 43, they started taking what was left of their carrier, uh, of their carrier fleet, sending the, the planes down to a ball and then on down into the Solomons to oppose the and uh, by the end of February 44, when they evacuated them, they had lost nearly all of their fighter leaders, and, uh, they, and they did not have anything to replace it with. We didn't know it, but, uh, but, the, but by the time that the, 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 the Mariana Turkey shoot came along, we were fighting a force that was a shadow of itself. But in November 43, the Hellcat showed what it could do. At the, invasion, at, at the invasion of the Gilbert Islands, Tarawan, Macon. These are pilots from VF-16, November 30th, 1943, and this was the first time that they, that they ran across a big formation of Japanese aircraft, and in the course of two different battles on two different days, they shot down 35 Japanese aircraft with a loss of three Hellcats. And as you can see, they're a, a bunch of pretty happy guys. This is when they came back with 19 in one, in one fight. This is the first time the, the Navy was the one, the Navy was the one force that negated pilots' gunnery training. The Army Air Force didn't get formal gunnery training for pilots until 1943. Uh, Dick Baum came back from his first tour with a, tour of 20, with a victory of 27 uh, in, in New Guinea. He asked to be put through the, the advanced gunnery school. And when he got through the school, he said, if I'd have known this when I went there the first time, I scored the double one of this. And uh, the thing was, there were 305 pilots, or Navy pilots, that became aces in the Hellcat, shooting down 5,143 enemy aircraft, 63% of everything that the Navy shot down in the entire war. 43% of all of them, of, of all of them were shot down by everybody, Army, Army Navy, and Marines. And 
Of those guys, those are probably the highest number of aces in the day of any group of pilots, because they would come into these fights like, like, the, like when they hit when they hit uh, Truck Atoll, which was the Gibraltar of the Pacific, everybody thought in uh, February of '44. The first the first day, they shut down 65 airplanes in the first fight. And it took, an, it took a, uh, about an hour to do that. It was a swirling battle that. Uh, it was probably, it was at that time the biggest air battle that happened in World War II. Uh, but with, with these guys having this, the ability to, to, know, to know how to shoot, when they came up at it, they would come back with three or four kills at a time. Five, five kills, and then, as we'll see, seven and eight. The top eight of that group um, is, um, That's Tom Brown. He's the first Navy agent in the day. Okay. Um, and he finished about tw with about 12, but he, but he was the first one to shoot down five in a single, in a single fight. He, he said he thought the fight lasted about an hour, but then he looked at his watch and the whole thing just, it took about six minutes. This is Alex Gracia. Alex Gracia uh, started out as a Lieutenant J.G. who, uh, who, who Butch O'Hare took under his wing in GF-6 and made him his wingman. And he eventually became one of the top scoring... He had a, Alex had a big problem with other guys coming along right behind him. At, uh, by the time that they went to, to, uh, to, to hit truck, he had shot down six. He'd become the second Navy, the, the third Navy ace after Hamilton and Porter and Tom Brown. And he had six kills. He, he got a triple over over truck, and he had nine and he had nine victories. And for about 15 minutes, he was the top scoring Navy ace. And then Hamilton and Porter came along and uh, shot down two more and became the first double ace. And then. Uh, at the, uh, at the Battle of the Philippines, see at the Marion 30 shoot, he shot down six Jills, which was an all-time score, and 15 minutes later, Dave McCampbell shot down seven. Alex departed the pattern this last February. He was probably one of the nicest guys I ever met among, the, uh, among fighter races. There are, there are some pretty amazing egos among fighter races, you can imagine, but uh, his was always pretty much under control. Felix the Cat was the symbol for, v, for VF3, which became VF6. VF, when it was VF3, that was when, uh, when, when uh, O'Hare scored his five, kill, his, his five kills over defending the Lexington in February 42. Then it, the squadron was, was uh, demobbed after, uh, after Midway and then brought back and came back as VF6 in, 40, in 1943. But that's the squadron insignia. Felix the Cat. That's uh, famous. That it's still around now. Um, yeah, VF eighty uh, sixty-one. Yeah, VF sixty-one flies with Felix the Cat today. These are Hellcats on the Calpins. <clears throat> the one thing you should notice is that those carriers are not that big. That's a big carrier. But look at it. That deck is not that big. From back and forth. Side to side. This is the USS Essex, <coughs> the class leader. 27, 27 ships were eventually were eventually uh, launched in the Essex class. They were the most important group of capital ships made by any navy in the 20th in the 20th century. Um, by uh, October of, of 1942, at the Battle of Santa Cruz, we had lost. All but two of our of our pre-war carriers, the, and the Saratoga was in Bremerton Harbor, in, in Bremerton Navy Yard, being repaired from torpedoing, and the Enterprise was at Espiritu Santo, being given emergency repairs so that so that it could be the only carrier left. A year later, the Essex and the, the Essex, the Yorktown, and the Lexington showed up literally to the day, 
an overweight, an overweight guy and the Hulk, the Hulk had had his first combat with the, with the Japanese. And these are the ships that won World War II in the Pacific. Uh, the Essex could carry 90 airplanes. Could carry 90 airplanes. The uh, side elevator there in the center meant that they could take the airplanes up and down without having to without having to uh, put to, to, uh, to disrupt the deck. In the days before the before the angle deck, you had to rearrange the aircraft for launching and for and for landing. When the uh, when the Enterprise was at, was at uh, Santa Cruz, the, center, she had, the Enterprise had three elevators on the center line of the, uh, the thick, and the, and the middle elevator got, got blown down by them, and so they had a hole, a big big hole in the middle of the deck. They couldn't, for about, for about an hour, they couldn't bring the airplanes back aboard until they managed to put enough wood over top of that. And, but this, this saved that they didn't have to operate the flight, the, the, the carrier decks in action, the, the carrier elevator. Essex, by the way, is the number three ranked ship of the war after the uh, after Enterprise and U.S. of San Francisco. She was the top scoring of uh, her. She had of the uh, of the top five air groups of the war. Three of them flew off of the Essex in the course of the war. The F BF-9, which was the first ones to take the to take the Hellcat into action, uh, flew in, in the fall of 43 and up until March of 44. They came home in May of 44. She took aboard she took aboard Air Group 15, which turned out to be the top scoring air group of the war. Uh, at the at the end of the war, she brought in uh, Air Group 84, which ended up being the fifth rank air group of the war. This is, a, this is an example of why the Hellcat was a really good airplane. Because, because that, the pilot climbed out and walked away. The Hellcat was kind of an airplane. A, a moderately trained pilot could get it off the ship, could have a good, a, a good chance of holding his own against, an enemy, against the enemy. And if he was shot up or damaged, he could get it back. And, if the ship, if the deck was pitching, the deck could be pitching 15 feet, and all of a sudden he could be at 10 feet above the deck, and all of a sudden 25 feet as he, as he stalled out to land, the Hellcat could land and, and taxi out of the hood. And if it didn't, as something like that, there are, I could have, I could have put up an hour's worth of pictures of, of crashed Hellcats on, on flight decks, and every one of them pilot walked away, which was uh, a good thing because. They all count, but they were making 500 of them a month. They weren't making 500 pilots. The Hellcat was also used by the uh, by the British fleet air arm. The British loved it. Um, they they had the unfortunate problem in, in England that um, the RAF had controlled the naval air arm before the war, so they never managed to make any, any naval aircraft like like we did, and so that eventually the, uh, the best thing they could get was to put a Spitfire on the flight deck with a hook on it. And the Spitfire is a, is a beautiful airplane, but it's not an airplane designed to land on a deck that's pitching 15 feet. And uh, so when the Hellcat came on, it ended up being the airplane that they, that they used throughout the Pacific. This is done in the, uh, in the markings. This is a, 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 a Hellcat here. This is out of Chino a couple of years ago. Um, but the uh, invasion strike. This is a, this was uh, flown off HMS Emperor in the, in the uh, invasion of southern France in December '44. Which is what those Americans are. I always love it. The Hellcat with invasion strikes. This is Dave McCampbell, the Navy Ace of Aces, the third-ranked American Ace of World War II, 34 victory. Uh, Dave was a, was a pre-war pilot. He, uh, he graduated uh, in the bottom half of his graduating class in Annapolis in 1933 and was immediately sent home. This is the height of the Depression, uh, the depths of the Depression. He, did, he was brought back a, a year and a half later and, and, and to active duty. Two years after that, he, took, he got into flight training. 
He was sent to VF4 in the summer in the summer 1940. He was the um, he was one of the top three Navy pilots in, in, the, in the fleet gunnery competition. At which point, he then joined the USS Wasp as a landing as a landing signal officer. He was aboard the Wasp until September 42 when she was lost. Uh, he was the guy that if anybody's ever heard the story about the Wasp stinging twice when they went, when they took Spitfires to Malta. On the second on the second one, one of the Spitfires lost its dropped lost its fuel tank and came back it didn't have a tail hook and he landed it aboard the 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 uh, the he said the, the guy floated halfway down the deck before they, before they before he touched down they cleared the deck and they were going as fast as they could into the uh, in, into the wind and they finally landed and, 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 and when the guy came to a stop he was they said that he could take three steps and get off the end of the bow. He went up to the pilot and said, well, you must be very experienced to, to be able to bring a, a Spitfire back aboard. And he says, I have about 30 hours in the Spitfire. Well, you must be a very experienced pilot. I have 150 hours total. Uh, they, that night, they, they took the guy below and they initiated him into becoming a naval aviator. And they flew him off to, flew him off to, to uh, Mulder. He was on the next, on the next flight. And he was lost on the Mulder, but he, uh, but that was a, a very interesting mission. Uh, Dave, by the way, came back from, uh, from the, from the South Pacific and went and was put in charge of the LSO school at Jacksonville. And it looked like he was going to be out of, you know, he'd been three years away from complete, complete aviation. But he managed to convince him that he should be able to be put in charge of a fighter school. And so he got put in charge of VF-15 in August of 1943. And uh, he got two, two very interesting senior uh, division leaders, uh, Jim Strain and, uh, and George Duncan. Uh, uh, Strain, had got, Strain came from, from, the, uh, from instructing at uh, Pensacola, and Duncan had been, a, uh, had been an observation pilot on the U.S. of Pennsylvania. He claimed that I proved to them I was a fighter pilot when I when I shot when I shot down a zero in a, in a uh, kingfisher up in up, up, up in the Aleutians. But he uh, but they came down and uh, Dave was having trouble scoring. But again, but again, he he might he was there was some problem that he might not qualify to be the to, to be the uh, a squadron commander. So Duncan and Strain decided that he was the best CEO they'd run across so far in their Navy career. And so they, what you did with, with training was you put paint on the on the on the bullets, a certain color. You went out and shot the sleeve, and it would leave a color in the in the, in the hole. And then they would judge, and they could judge how many how, how many hits you had. So they went out and painted their bullets the same color as the Campbell's. <laughs> and I went out and beat, and and lo and behold, he came back and he scored. And qualified, but he had a feeling he knew what had happened. And uh, as Jim Duffy told me, uh, they went out from, from that from that day on. They went out two to three hours a day, gunnery practice before and, until they until they left. They were every every one of them was a good shot. And uh, as, as Dave said, when he got, when he shot down his first zero uh, in the Marianas, I I saw him. I knew I could shoot him down, and I did. And uh, VF-15, VF when they when air group, they, when the air group went aboard the Hornet, they, uh, they ended up they, uh, literally in the Hornet's nest. Miles Browning, the most irascible officer in the Navy, was the commanding officer. Um, everybody who ever met, I, I talked to three guys who served under him. And, they all said he was the worst officer I ever met in my entire Navy career. He was, uh, yeah. But he managed, he managed to uh, actually create the two top scoring groups in the war because he he kicked Air Group 15 off of the ship when they got to when they got to Hawaii being unqualified. They went out to, to to Maui for six weeks and got and got final training and then they ended up on board the Essex. And by the luck of the thaw, they went aboard the Essex so that their so that their six months would would, would cover the two greatest battles in naval battles of the Pacific War, the first and second battles of the Philippine Sea. As Jim said to me, um, 
And it wasn't so much that we were the better pilots than anybody else, we just had more opportunity. But uh, they were replaced by Air Group 2, which went out and, 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 and on the Hornet, came off the Hornet just before Leyte go, but they have, they were the number two ranked uh, group of the other one. But um, they shot down seven Jills on, on this day in, in 1940 with the, the Japanese. Um, they, the, the six Japanese carriers um, launched three different strikes that day. Um, most of their pilots could barely get on and off a carrier by this point. They, they were they weren't they weren't exactly clay pigeons, but they were pretty much targets, and they and they were pretty thoroughly wiped out. Of um, 371 airplanes were, were claimed by the by the Navy pilots uh, for a loss of 14 Hellcats. Uh, only 120 Japanese airplanes that were launched from the carrier got back, and Japanese carrier aviation was over with uh, by that point. Although the the U.S. Navy did not know that what kind of a victory they had scored because by, by that time uh, we were not reading the Navy's the, the enemy's mail. Everybody thought we, we read the, we read the codes all through the all through the war, but it's not true. The, in the in the Pacific, the last time they read the Japanese mail was the week before Midway, which was fortunate. But the, the month after Midway, the Japanese changed the code. Then they changed the code again in August of '42. And then they changed the code again in, in the spring of 43. And by that point, they were, they were nowhere near close. They came close in, in March of 44, Admiral Koga, the commander of the, of the Japanese fleet, was transferred, was flying from Palau to, to Mindanao and was lost in a, uh, in a, in a storm at sea. And uh, his chief of staff was captured by Philippine guerrillas. And he had both the plan for the Japanese uh, battle at the, at, 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 uh, the Marianas and the latest code book. But by the time the submarine had gotten the code book and got it back down to, to, to Australia, the Japanese had changed the codes and changed the plan. But, so they never, so, so the Navy didn't know that the, uh, the, the Shokaku and the, and, and the Taiho, the two carriers, had been sunk by submarines. And they were carried as, as, miss, as missing in action until September 44. That had a a great deal of, of effect on Admiral Halsey's decision to go chasing after the carriers at, at Lake Hill Hill and uh, nearly losing the battle because of that. But uh, Dave shot, uh, the, and his, um, Spike Borley was, it was Dave's wingman on the mission. It was, one, it was his first combat mission. And he managed, and Spike managed to, to not charge his guns before, he got, before, before they went into action. And so he couldn't shoot. But, he managed, to stay, he, he managed to be the one who stayed up with, with Dave all the way through what Dave was doing. When they got back to the carrier, he, Dave congratulated him for staying with him and said, why didn't you shoot? And he admitted to him what had happened. And he figured, as, uh, as, as Jim Duffy said, it was always, it was always well known that, that Dave McCampbell was a fair and understanding CO. If you screwed up, there was a fair chance. It was understood that if you screwed up, there was a fair chance he'd get an you. But, uh, Dave, but Dave just looked at uh, a spike and said, that won't happen again, will it? And it never did. Uh, but, but Dave went to, he started at one end of a V, drove around, and by the end of the thing, out of, out of nine airplanes in that V, he shut down seven of them. And uh, later, in, the, in, uh, in, in October of 44, at Lake Hazel, he and Roy Rushing uh, intercepted intercepted 40 Japanese fighters and uh, Dave shot down nine and Roy shot down six shot down six that was the all-time record for, for two pilots in the Navy. And they were actually in anybody's airport. But at a time. Um, uh, but the uh, the uh, Air Group 15 shot down 67 and a half airplanes on, on this day, which was the all-time American record. Um, VF2 was the, number, was the number two with 51. Uh, VF1 shot down 47. VF16 shot down 43. VF27, which was which, which was would end up being the top-scoring uh, light carrier group, 
uh, shot down 30 of its Air Force missions of war. But that's an example of what happened. By that time, the, the Japanese pilots, a Japanese pilot who was entering that battle had probably had around 180 to 250 flying total. The lowest, the, the lowest, most inexperienced ensign in, in, in the Navy that was taking off the, was taking off the ship that night was going in the battle with 600 guns. Edgar 15 on their on their return home, they shot down 368 aircraft in, in the six months they were there, and a, in a total of 15, mis 15 missions where they ran across the enemy. Now, that was the thing about naval warfare. You, you spend a couple of weeks at sea, not not seeing action, and then you and then you'd end up doing three or four days worth of strikes, and it was 24/7. This is Phil Brandt, who um, he departed the pattern this last March. He's in BF2. He said he's a very interesting guy because he was when he uh, when he died in, in March, he was the last member of BF2 still alive. But uh, on June 11th, of 1944, they were making they were making a strike against the Ghana Harbor in, in, in Guam, and as he said, I was flying. There was 1,300. There were 13,000 feet, and I was in Hellcat 13. And he got hit. And he bailed up. When he bailed out, when he opened the parachute, the, the, the foot got caught in the light, and he ended up going face first into the water, getting out from underneath the parachute. He's there in the middle of Ghana Harbor, and nobody can come get him. And the, the, the rest of the strike keeps the Japanese away from him for a while, and the guy comes by and drops him a, a, a raft. <laughs> and then they have to go. They're out of fuel. Well, they did call for the for the submarine for the for the submarine lifeguard and the singer is going and the fortunate thing is that the Marianas on the west on, on the western side are where are where the Marianas trench is. The deepest part the deepest place in the ocean, right on the edge of the Japanese and Pacific plates, tectonic plates. And so the Ghana Harbor is really deep. And so the stingray was able to come into the harbor, submerged. They raised the periscope, and it took four times for them to convince Don to, 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 to put a lot to put a, his rope around and lasso the, per, the periscope. But then they lasso the periscope, and they started and then suddenly started backing out of the harbor. And they towed him, they, they him about a mile and a half out to sea, where, where they were beyond range of the, and, and surfaced and, and, and rescued him. And it was one of the more amazing rescue of uh, the uh, 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 amazing rescue submarines made. This is Bill Dean from VF2. He was the commanding officer. Bill Dean had a very interesting philosophy that nobody else, no other commanding officer had. He did not have favorites. He, uh, he, he and he did not take all the top missions for himself. If if it was if it was a a, a, a combat air patrol over the fleet, he was as likely to take it as a, as a junior ensign in his squadron. He made, when, uh, when, when they made their first strike against, uh, against Iwo Jima, he, he sent all the guys who hadn't scored yet. So that they could have, and, and instead of having you know, guys with 15, 20 scores, he, these guys all ended up with scores between 8 and about 12. But, but, he had to, but they had 28 of the 36 pilots in the squadron who were, were aces. It was the highest number of aces in the squadron. Because, it, because he felt that, that if everybody had a chance, everybody was going to do their best. And the record of the, the, record of the squadron certainly proves it as well. This is Butch Boris. Uh, Butch, Butch scored his first victory over the Royal Canal in, in, uh, in 1942, and was immediately shot down by the by the Zero's wingman, and then a crash landing in Henderson Field, and spending another year in, in the uh, hospital before he ended up with VF2 in the summer of 43. He uh, he ended up becoming a double ace with VF2, and after the war, he was the founder of the Blue Angels. 
And that's all, all of the stuff that I have right now about, about the Hellcat and that. I uh, <clears throat> want to close, though, with the, you can't tell the story about the Hellcat at Camarillo Airport without telling the story of the Battle of Los Angeles. May 1959. By this time, Hellcats are being used as drones by the, by the Navy, the targets. And over at Point Magoo, they launch a drone. It's supposed to go out over the ocean where they're going to have where some ships are going to shoot at it. And it gets up to about 10,000 feet, to about 7,000 feet, and it gets a mind of its own. And it heads down, heads down the 101 towards Los Angeles. And uh, so they, this at the time was Oxnard Air Force Base, and they and they had a squadron of F-89 Scorpions here for air defense, and the F-89 had had what was equipped with rockets, 104 2.75 inch rockets, 52 in each wing pod. And they launched these two air, airplanes to go get the Hellcat. Uh, they ended up firing all, 100, all, all 208 rockets. They didn't hit the airplane. They started 14 fires in northern, in northern Los Angeles County. They hit four cars. And the Hellcat eventually ran out of gas and crashed about eight miles east of, of uh, 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 out, 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 out in the desert. And, um, it, uh, and it, um, parts of it are still to be found. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the famous Battle of Los Angeles where the Air Force couldn't shoot down the front there. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, there you go. Okay. Next speaker in here. We, it happens that uh, Jim Duffy's uh, daughter is here, Kathy Kaloe. Jim is the last living ace to have scored at the uh, at, at, at the Mariana Turkey Shoot and Lake Gulf. He uh, can't come, can't come visit us today, but I thought we might take a couple minutes and, and let Kathy tell us what kind of person her dad is on Father's Day. Okay, um, Kathy. This is a surprise. First of all, I didn't know about this. Tom had. Uh, emailed me, uh, asked if my dad was up to coming and talk. And he's 96 years old now. He's pretty much homebound. But I have to tell you, he's our family hero. I have learned more about my dad's adventures during the war the last 20 years that I did when I was a little girl, of course. And my dad always loved flying, but he, um, of course, raising the family, never had a chance to go back and fly until the 1970s. So he did enjoy flying from the 70s. And just about 10 years ago, the doctor said, it's time to stop. So he let his license lapse rather than go for a physical and fail it. Because he said, once you fail your physical, you'll never get it back. But he is a, a wonderful father, good husband. I've just been very blessed. And I um, learned a lot more reading Tom's book and what these guys went through, both on the aircraft carriers and just fighting the battles, is just amazing. So I encourage you, if you don't know too much about these battles and the planes themselves, I would buy this book, as I'm buying another one. It was really good. Oh, no, it's just fine. <laughs> anyway, I just want to let you know my dad would be very honored and humbled to have you here. And um, anyway, we're just very blessed. Thank you.